Poland, 1945. In the remote Sudeten Mountains, a group of German scientists wait anxiously for transportation. The Red Army is closing in fast. No one wants to get captured. World War II is ending, and they know they are on the wrong side. A convoy of eight trucks arrives. The scientists board three of them and get underway. A sense of relief blossoms. A few try to even get some sleep. But then their trucks peel off from the rest and head deep into the forest. A question lingers. Where are we going? The trucks stop and the taillights fall open. A line of black uniforms with weapons raised and SS runes on the collars scream for the scientists to get out. For the first time, they know what is coming. They are moved into two evenly spaced lines above a precisely measured ditch, 10 meters long, two meters wide. The gunshots come quickly and easily. Soon, all that remains of those 62 German scientists and the knowledge of what they had worked on is a neat mound of freshly dug earth. Within a year, it's gone, leaving no trace that anything had ever happened. Fifty years later, a photocopy of a 1956 magazine article lands on the desk of defense journalist Nick Cook. He writes for Jane's Defense Weekly, the premier magazine for the defense industry. On the face of it, the article looks silly. It's titled, The G Engines Are Coming, and it discusses the budding new technology of anti-gravity. Cook is about to toss it into the recycling, but something catches his eye. The article quotes several major defense industry leaders, in 1956, saying that anti-gravity was the next big breakthrough. They said they could do it, and all the major defense companies had large-scale programs working on it. Cook wondered, could that be true? And if so, what happened to all these projects? He began his search in James's extensive library. He found yet another article this time in the aerospace magazine Interavia. It was dated March 23, 1956, same year, and it made the same claims. Major defense companies like the Glenn L. Martin Aircraft Company, later to become Lockheed Martin, Bell Aircraft, and even General Electric, all had active programs working on anti-gravity. And not only that, but several had reported success, reducing the weight of materials by up to 30%. Cook knew Interavia. It was the top aerospace journal in the world. It was not a place to publish science fiction, yet there it was. 1956, anti-gravity. All the big companies are working on it. So Cook continued his research. Soon he noticed something odd. By 1957, all talk of anti-gravity stopped. By 1960, it was as if it had never happened. He wrote in his book, The Hunt for Zero Point. The evidence was suggesting that in the mid-1950s there had been some kind of breakthrough in the anti-gravity field, and for a small window in time, people had talked about it freely and openly, believing they were witnessing the dawn of a new era, one that would benefit the whole of mankind. Then in 1957, everyone had stopped talking about it, had the military woken up to what was happening, bringing the clams down. Cook had seen this pattern before. This is what happens when a new military technology goes dark. It happened with nuclear weapons. In the 1930s, scientists spoke openly about atomic energy and fission. Newspapers and magazines printed articles about it. But by the time World War II and the Manhattan Project got underway, all public discussion of nuclear fission stopped on a dime. Soon. Engineers could barely recall ever even thinking about it. Cook wondered if the same thing had happened with anti-gravity. Did the science become classified? It was a stretch, he knew that. But he still thought it was worth investigating, so he dug deeper. He quickly found a top secret US memorandum dated September 27, 1947. This date is about three months after the alleged UFO crash at Roswell. Its author was Lieutenant General Nathan R. Twining, head of the U.S. Army Air Force's Air Material Command. In it, he states that the flying disks reported during the recent cluster of UFO sightings that summer had been, quote, something real and not visionary or fictitious. 
He went on to say, It is possible within the present U.S. knowledge, provided extensive detailed development is undertaken, to construct a piloted aircraft which has the same general description of the object above. The object above meaning the UFOs. This document was declassified in the late 1970s. Why would General Twining believe that the U.S. already had the technology to build aircraft with the same characteristics of UFOs? Was he mistaken? Or was it something else? In November 1944, the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff established the Technical Industrial Intelligence Committee. It aimed to acquire as much advanced German technology as possible by the close of World War II. From its efforts emerged a document declassified in the 1960s called Luftwaffe Secret Technology. The document revealed that starting in 1944, the Germans had constructed an extraordinary number of large underground facilities across Europe. These facilities were used to conduct research and produce military hardware. One such facility was located inside the Wenceslas mine in what is today southwestern Poland. This mine is the site where the Nazis, fighting on all fronts and increasingly desperate to win the war, turned to a form of science the rest of the world had never considered. Somewhere in this cauldron of ideas, a new technology had been born. One that was so far ahead of its time, it had been suppressed for more than half a century. As Cook dug deeper, his colleagues at Jane's recommended a new contact. He was a fellow defense journalist in Poland named Igor Witkowski. He had spent months combing through old archives of secret weapons projects for the Third Reich. And by chance, he had stumbled on the most secret project of all. Its details seemed more like a myth or science fiction, yet according to Witkowski, it was absolutely real. The project's codename was Kronos, but today it is simply called The Bell. On June 28, 1944, Nazi General Jacob Spornberg was given command of a highly secretive unit within the SS. His task was to smuggle as much advanced German technology out of Europe before the end of the war. The Nazis didn't want any of it to fall into Allied hands. Yet in 1945, Spornberg was captured by the British and eventually found himself in the custody of the Poles. There, he was interrogated and likely tortured by Polish and Soviet intelligence agents. He told them everything, including all that he knew about the Bell, otherwise known in German as Die Glocke. Die Glocke was a large bell-shaped machine kept hundreds of meters below ground inside a secret facility in occupied Poland. Inside it were two contra-rotating cylinders filled with a mercury-based substance called Zerum 525. General Spornberg said its color was violet. When the bell was switched on, it drew an enormous amount of electricity from a nearby power plant. The two mercury-filled cylinders, one inside of the other, spun in opposite directions at extremely high speeds. The device then emitted a pale blue light that killed everything it touched. Five of the original seven scientists working on it died after exposure. Various plants and animals were placed near the bell. Nothing survived. A strange crystalline substance would form inside the cells of living tissues. And in the case of plants, the chlorophyll would suddenly disappear, rendering their leaves a ghostly shade of white. They would then decompose into an odorless, thin grease. Scientists inside the Wenceslas mine facility were kept 150 to 200 meters away from the bell whenever it was switched on. Yet many of them still suffered side effects, including memory loss, sleep problems, and muscle spasms. And according to Sporenberg, the bell was successfully smuggled out of the country. So when the Soviet Red Army arrived, all they found was a flooded mine and some tire tracks. In Igor Witkowski's view, the bell represented an experiment into anti-gravity. He pointed to this structure, above ground, near the Wenceslas mine. I think it's a test rig, a test rig for a vehicle or an engine of some kind, a very powerful one. But Cook wasn't satisfied with that explanation. He believed the bell existed, but anti-gravity? 
there wasn't enough evidence for that. Still, whatever the bell was, it didn't seem to conform to the realm of conventional science. So to better understand unconventional science, Cook began to look into the work of Victor Schauberger. Born in Austria in 1885, Victor Schauberger appears to be one of those rare intellects that views the world in an entirely different way from his peers. He refused any form of formal education, and yet his inventions and scientific discoveries are still studied to this day. His most famous idea was a form of power generation called implosion. He said the world has gone down the wrong path. They've gone down the path of explosion. Think about it. Everything we do is primarily based on explosion. The internal combustion engine explodes to create power. He says the greatest power is in implosion. When water goes through a funnel, it has a swirling action like a tornado. How powerful is a tornado? Well, it can lift an 18-wheeler and throw it aside. During World War II, Schauberger was already in his mid-50s, yet the Nazis forced him, by threatening his family, to work for the Reich. In fact, it was SS leader Heinrich Himmler himself who ordered that Schauberger continue his work on a new form of electric generator that he had been working on prior to the war. Schauberger called this machine the Repulsine, and it used his concept of implosion. He designed it as an engine to power a new form of aircraft called a Fliegenscheibe, or flying disc. And it was powered, supposedly, by anti-gravity. According to Schauberger's diary, final assembly of the Repulsign began on April 5, 1945. A month later, it was finished. Yet on May 6, the day of its first test, the SS officers overseeing the project fled. Germany had lost the war. And all work on the Repulsign stopped just hours before the country's official surrender. But what happened next was a little strange. Schauberger was immediately apprehended by American intelligence agents who, according to Schauberger's diary, seemed to already know everything about the work he had been doing. They confiscated his equipment and his research and kept him in protective custody for the next year. During that time, he told them everything he knew. Schauberger would later write that it was as if someone had guided the Americans directly to him. But what exactly was the Repulsine, and how did it work? According to British author Callum Coates, the Repulsine looked like a large turbine, or the intake to a jet engine. Yet instead of propeller-style rotary blades, it used impellers, which forced air inward instead of outward. The impellers would then spin so fast as to affect the molecular structure of the air passing through them through the interaction between centrifugal and centripetal forces. Functioning on a common axis, he was able implosively to return or retransmute the physical form of air into its primary energetic matrix. A non-spatial fourth or fifth dimensional state, which has nothing to do with the three dimensions of physical existence. Did that make any sense? I'll admit, it didn't make any to me either. But to certain scientists, apparently it does make sense because the process described is eerily similar to a concept in modern theoretical physics called zero-point energy. And that is what we ordinarily consider empty space isn't empty at all. Even if you go to the far reaches of outer space, it turns out that rather than emptiness, what we call the vacuum <clears throat> is really a seething cauldron of what we call quantum energy or zero-point energy. Zero point just simply means that even if you froze the entire universe down to absolute zero, froze out all motion where everything would be as quiet as you could possibly get it, this energy is still there. Zero point energy is a complex topic that deserves its own video. But for now, just understand that if scientists can find a way to tap into it, and it's possible they already have, it would provide free, completely unlimited energy to the entire world. An invention like that could upend everything. But also, in the wrong hands, it could be used as the most devastating weapon ever made. If you took all of the energy that's in this amount of space time and were able to tap it, it would be able to boil off the oceans of the entire planet. 
So you can see how this technology makes a hydrogen bomb look like a firecracker. The point is, if the United States apprehended Schauberger and all of his work in 1945, then it might explain why two years later, General Twining wrote in that secret memorandum mentioned earlier, that the US currently had the knowledge to build aircraft with the same performance characteristics as UFOs. So the question is, who was flying the UFOs above American skies? Aliens? Germans? Or, as Twining wrote in that same memorandum, a domestic group operating some high security project that he was not aware of. But what about the bell? What were the Nazis doing with it? Was it an anti-gravity engine? Or was it something more? As Nick Cook continued down the rabbit hole, he came into contact with a well-regarded physics professor at a top British university. To protect the professor's identity, he gave him the pseudonym of Dan Marcus. Cook had emailed him all the details he had learned about the bell so that the professor could help explain all the physics. Weeks went by without any reply. Cook worried that Marcus had simply written him off. But then one rainy afternoon, Marcus called. Nick, I know what they were trying to do. They were trying to generate a torsion field. If you generate a torsion field of sufficient magnitude, the theory says you can bend the four dimensions of space around the generator. The more torsion you generate, the more space you perturb. When you bend space, you also bend time. The final puzzle piece clicked into place. The Bell's codename was Kronos. Time. The Nazis were building a time machine. If you type torsion field into Wikipedia, you are immediately greeted with the word pseudoscience. You're also met with an oddly hostile article that never truly explains what a torsion field is. Instead, it devotes its entire length to angrily denouncing their existence. And look, maybe they are pseudoscience. I don't know. But think of it this way. If they are real and they can access zero-point energy, to say nothing of bending space-time, then they would be revolutionary. Everything modern physicists believe to be true would get tossed right out the window. And also, if proven true, they could open a massive Pandora's box. Now what separated the 1860s, which looked like antiquity to mm. many of us, from 1952 when we have the first fusion weapon explode? It was changes in our understanding of the physical world. I don't know why we're not more worried about this. I think because we've been failing at physics for 50 years, we've gotten out of the habit of thinking physics is really dangerous and you have to track every single important physicist because any change in our physical understanding of the universe can unlock holy hell. This would be a paradigm shift in science. So from that angle, it's easy to understand the hostility from mainstream science. But here's the crazy part, a torsion field which can be visualized as a spinning whirlpool of energy that can tap into the zero-point energy field. It would exist not in our three-slash-four dimensional reality, if you count time. It would exist only within the fifth dimension, what Professor Marcus called hyperspace, i.e. a realm beyond the vacuum of space. And the bell was tapping into it. Freaked out yet? Listen to this. Say, to use an extreme example, the Germans had been able to slow time within the area of the Bell's torsion field. This ceramic lined chamber to one thousandth the rate at which it was progressing outside, and you sat inside the chamber for a year. What you've done is slow time down on the inside, while on the outside it progresses at its normal rate. Step outside the chamber after a year has ticked by on your calendar, and you find yourself a thousand years into the future. This was the secret buried in the mass grave in the Sudeten Mountains in 1945. This is why those 62 German scientists were executed by the SS. The Nazis had kept the bell more secret than any other project they worked on. That is real. And according to the captured SS general, Jacob Spornberg, they successfully smuggled it out of the country. Where it is now is anyone's guess although some speculate it was traded by senior Nazi leaders to the United States in exchange for their freedom. And one final addendum. Beginning in November 1944, 
both Allied and German pilots started spotting strange flying lights in the sky. They were usually described as glowing orbs or disks. These lights would often tail their aircraft for miles, as well as play chicken with them and fly in formation. Amongst the pilots who saw them, there was zero doubt that these glowing orbs were intelligently controlled. Someone was flying them. Eventually, accounts of these early UFOs reached the newspapers. They were given the nickname Foo Fighters. By the end of the war, they were practically a common occurrence in the night skies, and no one had any idea what they were. Again, those sightings began in November 1944. The first test of the bell, tapping into a fifth dimension, was just before that November. I left something out when I first mentioned the bell. It in fact had two code names. The first was Kronos, meaning time. The second was Laternenträger, or Lantern Bearer. And perhaps that's what it truly was. A lantern or beacon to another realm, attracting something from there into here. It's possible. Oh, and one last thing. There was one mystery that Nick Cook never solved. It was the first domino to fall, the one that sparked his journey down the rabbit hole. That 1957 article, The G Engines Are Coming. Who put it on his desk and why? To this day, he has no idea. <laughs>